Just let me know when you're recording. You're live. Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here. Uh, welcome to U of T Robotics uh, Institute seminar series, which provides an opportunity for the robotics community at the University of Toronto to come together and interact with excellent researchers whose ideas are at the front, forefront of the, of the field. We are very excited to have the opportunity to welcome Professor Michael Poza from the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Michael leads the Dynamics Autonomy, the Dynamic Autonomy and Intelligent Robotics uh, Lab, uh, a group within the GRASP Lab. So Michael's group focuses on developing computationally tractable algorithms to enable robots to operate both dynamically and safely uh, as they quickly maneuver through uh, and interact with their environments. And some applications of uh, his work include legged locomotion and manipulation. Uh, I should say that Michael's work is well known for a very rigorous treatment uh, and rigorously looking at uh, contact modeling and the non-smooth dynamics that contacts induce, uh, as well as incorporating contacts in uh, planning, control, optimization, and learning. So it's, it's a very exciting uh, set of research uh, directions. Uh, Michael received his PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT in 27 uh, under the uh, supervision of Russ Tedrick, where among, among his other research, he spent time on the MIT DARPA Robotics Challenge team. Uh, uh, earlier than that, he, he received his uh, undergrad degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford in two, uh, 2007. Uh, and he also worked as an engineer at, uh, at Vecna Robotics in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, designing control algorithms for the bare humanoid robot. Uh, Michael's research has been recognized with many best papers, award, many best paper awards, including uh, one at uh, Hybrid Systems, Computation and Control, and has been a finalist for a best paper award at uh, IEEE Humanoids. Uh, he also received the Google Faculty Research Award in 2019 and the Young Faculty Researcher Award from TRI in 2021. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Michael for what promises to be a very thought-provoking talk. Thank you very much for that, uh, that kind introduction, Florian, and, and thank you, Florian and Kimberly and everyone uh, here at Toronto for having me. Um, I'm, I'm a little sad to not be here in person, but, uh, uh, you know, next time perhaps. Um, uh, on that note, and this is prompted by something Florian said a second ago, just to, uh, for people listening, a reminder that ICRA uh, is going to be in Philadelphia in May, it's gonna be in person. Uh, I think I saw we have a few thousand registrations uh, uh, already. Um, and so it's, and most of those are, are planning to be in person. So I, I would really encourage, you know, people who have papers there or just interested in, in sort of their, uh, seeing the robotics community in one place again to uh, come, come to Um Okay, so let me share my screen here. Um, we, we are remote, right? I know there's people on YouTube and, and on Zoom. Um, I, I would be love to have questions throughout the talk, right? If you, if you want to interrupt um, and, and jump in with a question, just do so at any time and, and we can make this a conversation. Um, uh, I know Zoom fatigue is, is very much real. So, so anything we can do to make it more interactive would be great. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about um, some, some work in, from my lab, um, all from the last couple of years, more or less. Um, and and uh, the title for today's talk is on hybrid robotics and implicit learning. Um, as Florian implied, a lot of this work is really going to focus on, on that interaction between robots and the world. So if you work in robotics, right, or, or have, uh, have a connection to the internet, you've probably seen this video from, from Boston Dynamics. It's, it's really impressive, right? Uh, and even this is like now a couple years old. Um, just the, the dexterity, the strength, the speed that they're showing off here in this parkour video. Looking at this, it almost makes you think that robots are, you know, approaching that human-like capability or, or, or maybe even there. Um, and as impressive as this video is, you just want to take a second and step back and think about what can humans actually do? Okay, so and if uh, uh, humans doing parkour, certainly expert humans look something more like this. Uh, and, and humans are also very capable at uh, various manipulation tasks. And for me, when I watch the human videos and I watch the robot videos as capable as the robots are, um, there are some, some pretty fundamental differences uh, between the, uh, the two. And the one I really want to highlight today is how that um, interaction between the world and uh, the robot has been very carefully scripted in this Atlas video, right? The engineers very carefully laid out uh, which uh, 
platforms uh, it was going to feed, feed on and what order and so on. Um, whereas humans are making these decisions very, very rapidly on the fly. Um, this uh, uh, decision essentially of what to touch, when to touch and how to touch it is being made online in a way that the robot is, the human, excuse me, the human is really leveraging the existence of things to touch in the world, as opposed to treating them kind of as, as a, a carefully prescripted uh, events that must take place. So just to set the scene a little bit, the, the type of robotics task that uh, motivates me these days uh, looks something like this. Uh, my robot uh, uh, is going to enter an environment. Uh, and it's going to enter some environment that maybe it hasn't really seen before. Uh, certainly that environment is going to contain novel objects uh, with uh, uh, novel geometries that are previously unknown. Um, and my robot relatively quickly is going to need to be able to accomplish a task. Right? And by this, I mean, um, let's give it a few seconds or a few minutes at most to figure out what it needs to figure out about its environment before it's going to go and accomplish a task, whether that's cooking or cleaning or some sort of assembly task. Before going on, just to, to kind of get this discussion out of the way, this talk is really going to focus on model-based strategies. Um, we're going to look at, at model-based control and also um, uh, learning strategies for what's well, called system identification or model, model learning. Uh, and, and the reason for this, um, you know, sort of more philosophically is relatively straightforward. I, I, I would like to uh, accomplish these tasks in an extremely data efficient fashion. Right? I want my robot to, to learn about its environment in seconds, not minutes. Uh, it doesn't have an a priori model that I can go off and do some real training on. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to need to be very data efficient. And I think that leads to towards a sort of more structured and more model based approaches. Okay. So what could go wrong in this setting? Well, a lot could go wrong, certainly. Um, and I'm going to highlight a couple of different challenges that are sort of the focus of the talk today. One is that the geometry of the world is very complicated. Right? The objects we want to interact with um, are, are not simple. Um, the properties of those objects right, are, are also very complicated, whether uh, it's a, some kind of surface property, how, how sticky or slippery it is, uh, perhaps how squishy it is. Maybe this, these properties are anisotropic. Maybe they uh, vary across the surface of, of the object. Um, things in the world tend to be pretty, pretty strange. It's block of cheese, obviously. Uh, and then lastly, the, the sort of interaction that we're going to need to plan with the environment um, is very complicated. And, and this interaction is um, probably the hardest thing to model accurately, um, whether that's from a data-driven perspective, as we'll see today, or even from a physics-based uh, point of view. If you look at, let's say, what all modern simulators are doing, um, where they differ essentially is how they handle contact. Right? That, that is the core problem of, of simulation for robotics. Uh, and that's sort of where, where simulators really make their mark is in, in different ways to try to approximate this, these contact dynamics. Okay. So today, um, rather than think about Boston Dynamics Parkour, we are going to take a step back. Um, and, and I'm really going to focus this work uh, entirely on fundamentals. Um, so we're going to go back to back to basics in a sense, um, and and uh, so sort of think about very rigorously if we can about how uh, physical structures can uh, affect learning and control. I'll we'll do that in a few different ways. We'll start by talking a little bit about uh, some recent control work we've done, model-based control, uh, and then we'll talk about learning uh, and, and focus really here on how uh, on why uh, learning models of of multi-contact motion multi-contact robotics is particularly challenging and then what we can do about it. Okay, so this is, um, this is work, you know, from, from back, back in 2013, 2014, this is on my, uh, in my thesis. Um, and, and we sort of focus on this sort of very basic question of, I want to plan some kind of motion uh, and I want to make decisions of what to touch, where to touch it and when. And if you think about this problem, um, it sort of quickly becomes apparent that gradient-based techniques um, can work, but have a fundamental flaw. And that flaw is that they can't reason about potential modes. So if I imagine tossing a ball to some kind of target, and I want to look at the gradient of, of say, the distance to the target with respect to my toss, well, you know, that, that gradient is nicely defined, and I can take derivatives, and I can do gradient descent, and so on, and that'll work out great. Except that gradient descent is almost never going to lead me to something that looks more like a bounce pass, if I throw the ball off the ground. Right? There's these sort of two, two options here that we have to consider, and, and gradients don't get us there. Okay, so 
Um, if you imagine not just having two modes like this ball toss, but having, uh, let's say, millions of modes corresponding to tens of contacts, then it's clear that simply reasoning about one mode sequence and hoping that's the right one is not going to work. And so the work of my thesis was really focused on, on this idea called contact implicit trajectory optimization, uh, which at a very high level took the hybrid structure of this uh, binary decision of this when, where, what, and embedded that into a nonlinear construct. Um, I'm not really going to go into the details then. Like I said, this talk is really focused on new work. But uh, because this is a somewhat mathematical talk, I want to give a, a few preliminaries here. And, and we're going to use this uh, notion of a complementarity system pretty regularly. So I, I want to try to make this as clear as possible. So uh, the basic sort of problem of, of modeling robot contact um, is often distilled something like this, where the hybrid dynamics can be written as what we call a nonlinear complementarity system. So it's a form of a DAE, uh, where you have some uh, differential equation, x dot equals f of x u, x state u input, and then also some kind of uh, other term here, lambda, where lambda is often going to take the role of the contact force. And then lambda is subject to some constraints. So for example here, lambda might be the normal contact force. G here might be the distance from the robot to an object. And this perpendicular constraint that forces a few different things, it says, well, you know, you can't have penetration. So G or phi has to always be positive. Uh, the force has to be positive, things only push. Uh, and then lastly, this orthogonality says, well, if G is not zero, okay, so if it's positive, then the force has to be zero. So if they're not touching, the force is zero. If G is zero, then the force can be non-zero. And this is how you get a hybrid problem from a nonlinear constraint. This is really just an implicit definition okay, of the dynamics. So implicitly defines f of x u via this relationship between force and state. If we want to do any kind of uh, uh, feedback or local control, we're going to need to make local approximations of this nonlinear complementary system. And one way to do that is via something called a linear complementary system, where essentially the smooth things up here, f and g, have been linearized about some nominal trajectory, and here and linearized in discrete time. But we've left the non-smoothness. Okay, so this is still a hybrid setting, uh, but it's a hybrid setting that with local linear approximations. And I'll, and I'll give a few examples of this LCS in a second. Okay, so here's a, here's a toy problem we'll use a couple times today. Um, so this is a ball, a point mass, it's falling, uh, and it falls in 1D, it hits the ground and it stops. Okay, about as simple as we can get in terms of hybrid, hybrid problems. Um, our dynamics look like this, our, our uh, acceleration is negative G, uh, and then if we hit the ground and Z equals to the ground height, then, then the velocity becomes zero. I can discretize this uh, using a semi-implicit scheme. Um, details not, not critically important here, but the, the time discretization uh, just for completeness is given here where the velocity update, so V next here, um, if you're not touching the ground, then it just goes down by, by gravity, okay? And if you are touching the ground, then the velocity uh, decreases rapidly. Um, and then there's a condition here based on how high you are and how fast you're falling and the step size and so on for whether or not you hit the ground or not. Okay. We can take this whole, um, this case structure here, right? This if else in the v-next update and rewrite that as a linear complementarity system. Again, the detail is not super important to showing how this discretization can, can be applied. There's a couple sort of things to take away though from these equations, right? One is that this is still a hybrid problem uh, and this complementarity structure embeds a hybrid problem with two to the number, the dimension of lambda modes up to that. Okay, so like, so uh, potentially exponential in the dimension of lambda. Um, so we haven't made our, our you know, nasty looking hybrid planning problem any easier, but we've just rewritten it. So let's keep that in mind. Um, but this is a sort of nice uh, compact structure if nothing else. Uh, and then more importantly, as we'll come back to later in the talk, there's this one over DT stiffness, right? So in, in continuous time, we said velocity changes instantaneously right, at an impact event going back to high school physics. In discrete time, um, there's different ways to do this, but the, the sort of, most common discretization looks something like this where you get a one over dt stiffness. Okay, so this, as dt goes to zero, right, appro approaches this uh, um, 
uh, instantaneous impulsive event, but in, you know, we, we get this uh, relatively stiff now differential equation. So again, going back in time now, 2013, 2014, by working on my thesis, came up with this trajectory optimization, uh, optimization strategy. Uh, it took something like um, a few minutes to 30 minutes, depending on the problem to run is very offline. Uh, I'm sure the, the modern methods are a little bit faster now, but, but this is not a real time control strategy, right? And so back then I said, well, the next thing I wanna do in my thesis was I wanna come up with a controller, a feedback law that is gonna run in real time, something like LQR, right? LQR or MPC, but for this multi-contact problem. All right, you can write that problem down using this idea of a linear complementarity system. So again, we're going to linearize about the nominal trajectory, uh, but we're going to leave the fact that you know maybe I get bumped off my mode sequence, maybe these I, I touch something else in the environment or, or bump into uh, into the world. Okay, so we have multiple modes that we can encounter, uh, and this is pretty important because you're never going to track your mode schedule perfectly, uh, and uh, particularly if you're doing something you're really contact rich, then you don't want to track it perfectly, but you may want to sort of reach out and brace against a wall that's not falling, for example. Okay. So our MPC problem looks something like this uh, equation I've given here, where it looks like your, your uh, familiar MPC problem where we've added in these lambdas and we've added in this complementarity constraint. And this is sort of the new thing here. Okay. This complementarity constraint in blue is quadratic. Right, this orthogony lambda perp uh, term that's quadratic in the decision variable. So this is a quadratically constrained QP, or alternatively, we could write it as an MIQP. Uh, but the important thing here is that it's not tractable. Right? We're not solving this as an MIQP uh, at real-time rates. Okay, so this idea now of, um, of real-time uh, uh, feedback has actually started to, to generate a lot of interest lately. Um, and, and I mentioned I've been working on this since 2013. Um, 2014. This is sort of the first time eight years later where I actually think we have a have a have a, a solution that's workable. So I'm so I'm super excited by that. But before I describe what we're doing, I want to at least um, uh, argue for for uh, the requirements I think it, it, we need to hit. Right, and this is important because this is a non-convex optimization problem. So it's very easy to say generate solutions to it, but but maybe not good ones. Right, and so how should we how should we judge whether a solution is good or not? Um, a few things have to, have to happen in my mind. One is the MPC algorithm is going to have to um, not necessarily assume the nominal mode. Right? Disturbances could, could happen. I could get bumped off my mode, or maybe I could uh, uh, reach out intentionally. I also can't assume the current mode. Okay, so what, you know, if I get bumped into, let's say, touching the wall, well, I'm going to need to sort of leave that mode and get back to my nominal one eventually, maybe touching something else in the meantime. And so I, my algorithm needs to explore different possibilities. Um, number three here is somewhat subtle. We need a pretty big prediction horizon here. Um, and, and the reason for that um, comes from this final cost term here, QF. Right? If you've worked on uh, optimal control at all, you sort of know that this final cost term here is serving as a heuristic for your value function or your cost to go. Um, and you know, realistically, this value function approximation or this cost to go heuristic only really makes sense if you're if you're uh, close to your plan, right? Uh, and probably even really only makes sense if you're in the nominal mode for your plan. And so our prediction horizon needs to see far enough into the future where you can kind of get back close to your nominal nominal motion. So for the uh, examples I'll talk about today, we're choosing n to the on something like ten or, or so. If this was continuous time, let's say, you know, uh, back in the dark robotics challenge, or let's say what Boston Dynamics does right now, often they're picking n to be like one, right? Um, and so, uh, I, I guess two as I as I've described it here. Um, and so, you know, that's not really going to cut it if we have to make a break contact. Uh, and then lastly, I think real time rates are, are important here. So, uh, question. Yep. Uh, so. Uh, which type of constraints would the uh, mixed integer quadratic program uh, would have? So what would be the integer constraints? Yeah, so this, um, that didn't really work. So this, this uh, uh, complementary equation in blue here um, can be replaced with a, an integer constraint. This blue equation is essentially an either or statement. It says that, uh, first off, both of these things, so lambda and this dxeuf lambda, et cetera, 
Both of those things have to be positive. Okay, that's a nice linear constraint, no problem. Uh, and then lastly, it basically says one of them has to be zero, at least one. Uh, and that's something you can replace with, with a big M integer constraint. Got it. Got it. One, one more comment. So there is a Zoom window uh, on your, um, so, so the Zoom screen that basically shows faces and things like that on your side. Oh yeah, uh, that's on, to, on the screen. To minimize that because, yeah. yeah. All right, let's see. Perfect, yeah, per yeah, that's great. Thank you. Awesome. I don't want to block the students who do all the homework, especially. It goes up in front of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, all right, this is the goal, um, and I'll sort of highlight what, what we can do with this. Well, this is uh, recent results here where we can solve this NPC problem here for three contacts. This is uh, two fingers in red, balancing a block in blue. Uh, the block also can touch the ground, and we're sort of drawing contact forces in, in simulation here. This is a prediction horizon of 10, three contacts, uh, so something like 30 modes if you count sliding and so on, uh, at about 30 hertz. Okay. Um, Super excited by this, right? This is, this is still sort of a toy problem here, uh, but we're solving this at real-time rates and getting feedback to work. Uh, perhaps more exciting, we can actually do this in a real system as well. A slightly simpler real system. This is a cart pole uh, that we're showing here well, with a couple uh, relatively stiff foam walls that it can slam into. Uh, and the uh, MPC algorithm here is running in, in real time. Uh, and so I'm pretty sure this is, as far as I know, at least the first kind of, uh, NPC algorithm running in these multi-contact problems that's running in, in a real system in real time. So, so I'm very excited by that. Um, what is this? It's basically uh, a, a consensus ADMM algorithm um, where uh, the consensus is applied across time steps. And, and that's sort of the key insight here that, that Alp had uh, in, in generating this algorithm. If we look at our consensus ADMM approach, which we're calling, uh, calling C3, um, the first stage is basically just a QP. It looks like your normal MPC QP. It ignores the complementarity terms. And then the second step here is a projection onto the complementarity constraint. That's the hard part of the problem. Um, but via the consensus formulation, you can make those projections independent across time steps. And so you end up with N small projections, for instance, via small MIQPs or heuristics that we were exploring. And, uh, uh, and then the last step is your sort of normal ADMM update the update the dual. I think the the exciting thing here going forward is sort of really looking at these heuristics. Right? What can we do uh, to speed up this projection? As you can imagine, we're solving a non-convex problem with ADMM. We've totally given up on global optimality. I think that that really is kind of the first thing that has to go in this problem domain. Um, you can't ask for global optimality because it's never going to be fast enough. Uh, and so, really, you know, the the uh, algorithmic insight is finding uh, suboptimal strategies that still have those properties we want and still do more exploration, uh, uh, but are fast enough. Just um, as a some, some slightly related project here, I, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but this is work on uh, integrating tactile sensors. Um, and so for people who have worked on on, on this say mode detection, whether it's for walking or manipulation, it's pretty tricky to detect contact really quickly. Um, there's always at least a few milliseconds of delay. And, and those few milliseconds can be somewhat critical if that contact is very dynamic. Um, so this is a, a kind of a really um, simple idea here where uh, Alp set out to design a control policy that directly incorporated measured forces lambda into a feedback law, in this case, a linear feedback law, this linear in force in, in state. Uh, and use that to, to stabilize the same car pole. Uh, the neat thing here is that these two controllers I'm showing in this video have actually are actually using the same K term, so the same uh, state-based gains from LQR. And the only difference on the left is what the controller does in that very brief, let's say 10, 20 millisecond window when it's slamming into the, into the pads. It turns out what you do for these dynamic problems in that small window really, really does matter. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears here now and talk about uh, model learning here for the rest of the talk. So um, this is the, the problem uh, uh, setup we're going to have. We're given some data that looks like this. This is a trace in SC3 of something happening. And our goal now is going to be to figure out what happened. Um, and uh, uh, if I might, maybe someone in the, in the audience might, might uh, posit a guess as to what's going on here.
I know we're on Zoom, so it's tricky. Looks like it looks like some sort of sliding. Card There's some kind of sliding, yeah, especially at the end, and then maybe some bouncing before that. Right? I, I think you know if we stare at this for long enough, we all start to get some intuition for what's happening. Right? It looks like something kind of hit something else, maybe right around here in time, and then it, that best by the end, it's sliding in between. We're not totally sure what's happening, but uh, some kind of bouncing maybe or sliding. Right. And if I give you a trace that looked like this, I think everyone would have a pretty easy time of saying what's going on here. This looks like a bouncing ball uh, and it looks like it's hitting a flat ground. If I try to learn this dynamical system, it is not gonna go well uh, using naive, naive methods, right? And, and there's a few reasons for that. I think the, the most basic one is that deep neural networks, for instance, bias towards simplicity, they bias towards smoothness, that bias towards low Lipschitz constants. And that comes from regularization that we typically would imply in, in a learning process. So if I try to learn the, the state transition as a function of f, well, what's going on for my bouncing ball in discrete time? My state transition looks something like this. And this is not low Lipschitz. This is not simple. Right? It's not amenable nicely to this bias that, I've that we've imposed in our learning framework. And I think this is important because it's pretty sort of natural to think about deep learning as being, you know, if I throw enough data at it, it's going to work. Um, and it's got this very general function of approximator, this, this universal function of approximator, right? Um, and, and, and it's sort of easy to lose sight of the fact that you, we actually are imposing biases into that framework, often again through something like weight regularization. But here, those biases are not appropriate. And I think there's one takeaway from the second half of the talk, it's that fact, those biases are not appropriate. Okay. One, one sort of um, insight that we'll come back to later is if you look at this bouncing ball figure here, there actually is something that's simple. And, and, and it's not the state transition, x and x as a function of x. It is, in fact, the geometry of the ground. The ground here is flat. That's about as simple and as low Lipschitz as you can get. Um, and so there is something simple. And what we're going to later do is try to learn the simple thing. Okay. But before that, I want to take a, a look at this difficulty from a couple different perspectives. So we'll start with um, uh, some purely empirical analysis here. Um, in this case, we're going to take a look at a simulator. This is a Majoko. And we're going to change a single parameter, which is thickness. And then we're just going to try to learn this state transition. And to do this, we're going to break the testing loss into a few different, few different uh, uh, forms. The first is an Oracle loss. So we have some noise in our, in our measurement system. And so an Oracle is still going to be a little bit noisy. And in fact, this is a chaotic system. I'm talking, we're talking essentially about throwing dice and watching them roll. Um, and so it's natural to say, well, there's, there's some difficulties here that are fundamental to the problem, okay? Uh, and those come, even an Oracle is gonna struggle. And in fact, yes, we see that the Oracle struggles more on the hard version than the soft or the medium stiffness. For references, video here is the medium version, medium stiffness. So still kind of soft, but, uh, but not super soft. Okay, so that, that blue part, we can't do anything about. We're sort of stuck with that, right? Um, but also we see that in fact that uh, these deep networks struggle to train on stiff data. So if we look at training loss as compared with the Oracle, I see that training loss as compared with Oracle is also much, much worse for stiff systems. Right? We even see some challenges, um, uh, despite our best efforts to do things like optimize hyperparameters, we even see challenges in just memorizing small data sets uh, if those small data sets come from stiff dynamics. Right, even in the sort of massively over-parameterized regime. Okay. And then lastly, we have generalization error. Okay. Um, and the generalization error basically doesn't go down as the amount of data goes up um, uh, for the stiff version. So, so across all three obviously, these, these things are, are inherently chaotic. Okay, can't do anything about that, but they're hard to train and they generalize poorly, empirically at least. Let's look at, look at that third, uh, third part here, generalization error. Um, and, and now um, try to apply some theoretical understanding to this. This is uh, a very recent work here, just uh, accepted to L4DC. Okay, and so there's some, there's some nice theoretical results here uh, that essentially say, you know, if you're testing on unseen data, you can uh, bound uh, the loss uh, by something that scales with the amount of data or, or the inverse amount of data you have and the Lipschitz constant of your loss with respect to your parameterization. 
All right, so, so we're trying to think about how we generalize. Let's go back to our, our bouncing, our, our falling point mass particle example. Again, the simplest hybrid problem. Okay. And if I write down my dynamics again, uh, this case taking a hybrid version and, and just for compactness, writing it with this max notation here, I see that my next state as a function of theta, which is my guess for the ground height. So I, I have a, a learning problem here where I'm just trying to learn where the ground is, scale or learning problem. Right. And I look at my loss, my, my prediction has this one over dt in it that we talked about before, theta over dt in particular. And so the Lipschitz constant of my loss, if I look at prediction errors, my loss has one over dt in it. This is not shocking. This is not shocking, right? I have a stiff underlying system, and right? So F is stiff. And if I'm using F in my loss, then my loss is gonna be stiff. And this is true again for this, even for this perfectly parameterized problem, right? It's a scalar problem, learning theta, learning the ground height. And it comes down to, to uh, actually I'll, I'll skip the plot now and come back to this figure in a little bit. Okay, so stiff dynamics lead to stiff losses. Okay. Um, on that previous slide, I had a sort of little aside on, on, on differential physics. Um, just kind of a, a note there, right? Uh, this is a, a topic that, that's very, very popular right now. Uh, and, and I think deservedly so, right? Some really beautiful uh, computational tools are coming out to differentiate through very complex simulators uh, and, and uh, multi-contact uh, settings. The uh, challenge, of course, is that differentiable physics um, provides an algorithmic derivative of contact, but that derivative just may not be nice. Right? It may be very, very large. It may be very stiff. And so just because that derivative exists, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's useful. Okay. And so what we've seen so far is that learning, whether from this sort of generalization-based perspective or from uh, an empirical perspective, learning with stiff dynamics is challenging and, and it works, you know, relatively poorly compared to soft dynamics, okay? Um, we've seen that, you know, if I were to say soften my simulation, then everything gets easier, right? So, so this to me says, be a little bit careful about, you know, trying to do, you know, whether it's deep RL or any kind of other data-driven method or optimization different method in a soft simulator, if you're then up trying, you know, intending to apply that to a, a relatively stiff real world, okay? That everything in a soft sim is easier than it is in a hard sim. And if the hard sim is more like the real world, you should be very careful. Right? We could smooth things out. We could soften everything. And that's what this figure here is trying to show. If you took your problem out and you regularized it heavily or you added smoothing, right, your fit to the yellow data points would be something like the blue curve, right? Which is okay, but misses the underlying stiff part of the problem. And if you care about that stiff part of the problem, then you, you probably want a different algorithm. So that's, that's kind of insights into the challenge. What are we gonna do about it? All right. Um, at a high level here, I think the loss is a big part of the problem. Um, the standard prediction loss um, is just poorly suited when F is stiff, right? What might be a little bit better? So, so let's take um, another toy, toy figure here. Uh, we have a real system in blue. We have some data points that are a little bit noisy in red. And, and let's keep in mind what the loss is trying to ask. The loss is trying to tell us how well does the data match the true function, right? And your normal prediction loss looks something like the pink arrow here, which is relatively large, even though in this case, the data was actually generated from the real system, with this middle data point at least. Um, we might like something, something else, something like the graph distance. So, so how far is that point from the graph of the, of the true function or the learned function? And that graph distance, it looks like this minimization problem here where you're minimizing over the, the deviation delta x. This is, this is the same as totally squares. Um, nicely motivated, not only for this figure, but also just in general for uh, problems where you have uh, uncertainty in, in x and y axes. Uh, I, I say like a maximum likelihood solution. But of course, this optimization problem here is, is intractable, right? It's a, a, it's a minimization over uh, f, basically, uh, f of x plus delta x, and that's not particularly useful. But it's a nice inspiration to keep in mind. For our bouncing ball problem, 
or falling particle, excuse me, problem. Um, we're going to do a couple things here. Uh, we're going to write down the physics implicitly. So I'm going to say, well, this function that we're trying to learn, uh, f theta, well, we're going to write it with a bar now because it's implicit. And it looks like gravity plus contact. Okay. Uh, and then it has a complementarity concern. It says, well, the force has to be, you know, I'll obey this complementarity law. And this is the same as we saw before. And the key insight here that, that, uh, that we had, this is uh, uh, David Bianchini and, and a few other students in, in my group in collaboration with Nick Matney, um, is to say, well, our loss should be something different. Um, our loss, in fact, um, should look something like this, where we want to compare the observed next state with this implicit dynamics function, and then we want to impose a penalty on complementarity. Okay. And then we'll do this all optimizing over lambda. Because so this says, I observed some state transition, x to x prime. And um, that ob observed transition, you know, if it's big, maybe implied that a force must have occurred. A lambda must have been non-zero, right? Uh, and then this last term is going to say, well, if lambda was non-zero, then, then your model should probably be close to predicting lambda non-zero via this complementary formulation. For this toy problem, this has just a sort of beautiful restructuring of the loss landscape. Um, the dynamics that we're trying to learn are still non-smooth up here in blue. The global solution is actually totally untouched. Um, and, and you can see that because if the, in the noiseless case, at least, I should say, you know, couch that statement, if the noiseless case, the global solution is untouched because this loss can, will achieve zero, right? If, if the, the model is perfectly correct and the data has no noise, your complementary evaluation will be zero and your prediction loss will be zero. Okay. But everything but the global optima is just totally reshaped. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the Lipschitz constant now uh, no longer scales with you know, one over delta t. In fact, it scales with an epsilon weighting term. Okay. And just to visualize that loss landscape, we can look at loss versus parameter error for this problem. And this implicit loss is the one shown in the dark purple here, um, zoomed in around the origin, sort of nice, not convex, that would be a little too much to ask for, but nice looking loss landscape. Whereas any kind of naive method, right? Let's say, you know, differentiable physics with stiff physics or wh whatever, you, whatever you like, right? Is gonna end up looking more like this one in, in the dashed uh, blue and pink line, uh, just incredibly, incredibly stiff, very nasty loss landscape. Okay. So we really, um, we really approach this problem from the perspective of uh, multi-contact physics or multi-contact robotics. Uh, we're really just now starting to think about how this generalizes. Um, and, and so I would really you know, love to chat about this later or, or give you feedback, but to kind of give the, the most general perspective here, right? Uh, your sort of standard learning, you know, explicit learning, you, know, you learn some function f of x uh, and that's why. Okay. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of really nice work on implicit learning. Uh, so various implicit layers uh, and their ability to represent nasty functions. And so implicit uh, layers, for instance, can represent very stiff functions naturally. So here, uh, y just has to satisfy f of x, y equal to zero. You also see things like optimization layers uh, embedded into learning. Um, you know, a, a lot of fantastic work in this area as well, uh, uh, let's say by Zico Coulter and others, um, where now you say, okay, the output is actually the solution to an optimization problem. Um, and then you can differentiate through this. So these are sort of are, are really nice ways to represent problems. Um, we're actually looking at a, a, at a sort of variation on this. So it's actually um, kind of generalizes everything, but in a very specific, I would say generalizes these ideas in the left, but in a sort of specific way, which is to say, um, we have uh, our output is some function of X and Lambda and Lambda now is a solution to an optimization problem. And what we're gonna learn is we're gonna learn G and H. Here. So, uh, you know, if you start these formulations for long enough, you'll see that in fact, you know, anything on the left can be can be encoded in the right. Um, but but more specifically, we're really interested in problems where um, the stiffness comes from this bottom problem here, this optimization problem, where where lambda as a function of x, y, and uh, uh, x and y is actually very very stiff. So question. Yeah. So a lot of these formulations rely on the implicit function theorem so that you can pass derivatives throughout. Uh, right. And there is a, uh, I guess there is an invariability um, issue there. So what happens when uh, 
the required matrix is not invariable and you have to um, you have to essentially add some identity to it how does that transform uh, how does that affect your um, your behavior in terms of uh, stiff dynamics and in terms of this non smoothness yeah that's a really great question that's a, it's a, it's it's a very, it's sort of a deep question um, and if you look at let's say the the non smooth physics literature um, including some of the work we've done in my lab um, you very often end up in situations where the solution is non unique uh, so things like um, uh, like four-legged tables and, you know, even dynamic versions of that problem where, where just like the, the notion of rigidity in the world combined with friction, combined with um, uh, impulsive contact leads to all kinds of pathologies, including non-uniqueness. Um, on the same time, if you, if you sort of look at uh, alternate say, simulator, simulators, there's lots of different things, whether it's Mujoko or, or other work by um, the TRI team or work by Anatescu that um, generates convex approximations to the, those contact problems. And those complex approximations work pretty well in a lot of settings. Even if they're very stiff, they at least produce unique solutions. So philosophically, I guess the answer to the question point is, at the moment, we're assuming that the implicit function theorem um, is, is going to produce sort of the right result here. Um, but, you know, it's open to debate whether that's always a good idea. Gotcha. I'll have some more questions about that at the end. Yeah, yeah, happy to Great. talk about it. So, um, okay, so we're taking this sort of general perspective here of what our, our problem formation might look like. Um, and then because we're saying lambda is, is, is uh, stiff, um, the traditional loss here, which says, okay, take your data, uh, feed the X through the network and, and get the Y out, and then compare that with your data Y, right? This is sort of what we want to avoid here. This is, I think, the, the nominal idea. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the takeaway here is, you can do this, right? And, th and this is sort of what a lot of really beautiful work right now is, is headed in implicit optimization, implicit learning. Um, sort of using implicit representations, embedding them as layers, and then kind of you know calculating the derivative using the implicit function theorem. You know where that derivative exists. You know lots of really nice computational tools are being built up around it. What I want to say here is, well, take a second and think about you know if that function you're trying to learn really is high Lipschitz, right? Then Yes, you can do this from a software perspective, but no, you maybe you don't want to. Okay. And so the types of formulations we've been really looking at look more like this, which is, okay, so we're going to assume a particular structure here, which is that uh, this H function always achieves a, a, a value of zero in the noise of setting. And so we're going to replace this whole uh, implicit optimization with a slightly a variation on it, a, a penalty-based version or a barrier function-like version, where we now optimize H and prediction error simultaneously. Okay. This only works for training, right? That's, that's sort of a key insight here, right? You can only do this if you know lamb, if you know why. So only for training is this, is this reasonable. For things like prediction or simulation or rollouts, we're always going to use the upper, the top version. But for training, we're looking at this, this bottom version down here. And um, like I said, we're really just starting to scratch the surface here of, of what of the theoretical side of this work, but but I, I I'm super excited by by this type of uh, of formulation. I think uh, it's something that, um, as we said, can leave the lost landscape, the, the minima untouched, but really reshape the landscape around it, which is what we want for good generalization and good training. Um, and then lastly, um, this is something we're still working on here, but but for some robotics problems, so where this whole GH GH structure comes from contact, we actually can say that our loss function here um, can be related to graph distance. Okay, so it's a nice proxy for graph distance. And if we minimize this loss, essentially we're saying graph distance also goes down. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of try to pick up the pace here a little bit because I know we're, we're getting close on time. Um, we took the same idea recently and applied it specifically to linear complementary systems. So, here we're looking at artificial simulated data, uh, where the system we're trying to learn is this is this LCS. It's a piecewise affine dynamical system, and we're just assuming we have noisier observations of state transitions here. So x and k, x, k plus one. If you look at like the hybrid version, the hybrid literature here, so let's say hybrid uh, system identification or piecewise affine identification, um, those all kind of have the flavor of of clustering, trying to identify modes. Uh, and then within a mode, trying to identify the linear dynamics. 
Um, but those only scale to a few modes, let's say tens, maybe. Okay. This implicit formulation that I, I just described actually scales to thousands of modes. So dimension of lambda uh, 10 or more uh, and, and stiff systems. And here I'm just showing a visualization of the learning process here in 2D. This is a 2D problem with four modes. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know, watching as uh, each iteration is taken, it's sort of very smoothly adjusting the mode boundary and the prediction simultaneously, as opposed to any kind of clustering approach. Every color here is a mode uh, being guessed. And you can see it here, in this case, it converges to the right mode. This work doesn't always converge, right? Particularly in those thousand mode settings, right? We do require things like random restarts. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, in this setting of, of linear complementarity system, which, which I think you know, can be rightly described as almost the most structured or easiest hybrid problem to think about, we can scale to thousands of modes, which to me is really saying, you know, if your dynamics or if your problem has this structure, you should be exploiting it, right? This problem is dramatically easier than a thousand mode arbitrary hybrid problem, or even a, a thousand uh, arbitrary, uh, let's say piecewise uh, affine problem. There's something about the structure we need to explain. Going backwards in time a little bit here, um, we can also do this in our real system, right? And, and so I'll, I'll sort of connect the theoretical work back to where we originally started here. We were thinking about throwing, um, uh, in this case, a cube on a table uh, and just trying to learn, learn its motion, right? And if you apply a relatively unstructured network, you get something like the, the visualization here shown in green, uh, which gets, position pretty close to correct, but really mangles orientation, doesn't understand anything about penetration through the surface um, or the fact that it comes to rest on, on a face. This is slowed down by a factor of 20. All right. And so um, this is sort of the, just the geometric interpretation of what I just discussed. Um, if you think about how a simulator works, right? Simulators look, look something like this block structure here where you have your continuous forces in uh, orange, gravity, torque, more torques, et cetera. Uh, then you have some kind of contact detection, collision detection block in red. And then you have a contact force solver down here. And, and all of the non-smoothness comes from that contact force solver. That's where all the nastiness comes in. And so what, we, uh, what we're looking at here, this is the idea of uh, this algorithm we're calling contact nets, is to say, let's learn the physics and geometry just from motion but we're gonna learn an implicit representation of that. So we're gonna learn phi, which is our, our distance function, our sine distance functions. We're gonna learn Jacobians. Don't worry so much about what these mean. These are just generalizations of geometry and friction. So phi, and J, phi is geometry, J is friction. Uh, and then we're also gonna learn the smooth, smooth physics simultaneously. What's sort of neat here, and this is actually unpublished, uh, we're actually using regularization in the learning algorithm to tell us the difference between the smooth forces over here and the contact geometry over here. And this is a, a just better aligning what we're learning with the biases in, in deep networks. So as we said before, um, in this case, very explicitly about physics, right? Simulation is not differentiable. And so we need a new loss function, right? And again, what we're doing is we're just not going to simulate our model, okay? For learning, for training. Right. For prediction, yes, I have to simulate my model. But for training, I'm not going to simulate my model. Instead, I'm going to solve an optimization problem. In this case, it's actually a QCQP or a QP, depending on how we represent the friction cone over possible forces. And then our losses are, are similar to what we saw already, which is the first law component has to explain the observed motion. And the second part has to match our learned geometry right? so that the, the force lambda should match our geometry. And if we do this, um, we get really effective of learning here from, from minimal data. Again, to, to emphasize, all we're training on here is observed motion. So we have opposing IC3, and we're trying to identify the underlying physics. Right? In the blue line here, we've imposed a pretty strong prior. We said, in fact, the geometry we're trying to learn here is that of a polytope. We don't know what polytope, but it's a polytope, and it's interacting with the plane and everything else is learned. If you impose that strong prior, uh, which is not unreasonable, but, but relatively strong, you see we can actually get really good results here in about five or 10 tosses. Uh, the geometry is essentially identified uh, very, very rapidly, uh, as well as all the other physical properties. 
Um, if you use no structure at all, you get something like the red line here. Again, this is our best attempt to, to uh, train this. And the sort of key thing to focus on here is the rotational part, right? It's it sort of just really, really cannot figure out uh, orientation uh, because orientation is being driven so heavily by uh, where the forces are applied on the on the cube between the cube and the surface. Um, the purple line shows our, our sort of earliest attempts at using deep learning here. So rather than saying we're going to learn a polytope, we're gonna actually going to learn a sine distance function as a deep network. And kind of surprising to us that that really we really sort of struggle to get that to work effectively. Uh, you see here it's training. It's not as good as the as the blue curve. In fact, it requires lots of data. Uh, it's working pretty well, I'd say. But but not perfect. Okay, and and I think um, you know this is very recent results unpublished here. But I think the problem for that is that our representation as the sine distance function was not not particularly good. Um, uh, and as soon as uh, uh, Matt had the idea to switch to representation via a support function, so now representing the geometry not as as uh, as a distance between the let's say the, the cube and the ground, but in fact as this as a support function. Um, it sort of worked immediately as a deep network. So here we're representing the support function as a input convex neural network, imposing heterogeneity as well, a positive heterogeneity. Um, and it learns very, very quickly from minimal amounts of data. So uh, super excited about where this is gonna go, but I think this direction is what's gonna allow us to infer uh, very complex geometries uh, from, from motion, so getting beyond the cube. Um, you know, as I said at the very beginning of the talk, this is this is really sort of work about going back to uh, back to basics in a way, thinking you know very hard about why robotics seems to require so much data, right? Why uh, why learning methods seem to require either sort of vast amounts of cinder real data or uh, impractical amounts of real world data? Um, I think we still have a long way to go, uh, sort of you know in this goal of, uh, of achieving human like uh, performance, um, but I do think. Some of the insights here are are are, uh, are key, and I, and I think um, the big takeaway is that these sort of standard learning or hybrid approaches um, are, are not appropriate. And, and I'm putting the scare quotes out there because you know um, again, really, there's nothing um, standard about learning with a CNN or standard about learning um, uh, with a particular network structure and weight regularization. You we are imposing biases, uh, and, and I think then the, the the next leap is going to come from opposing the right biases for our problem as opposed to applying whatever happened to work for, uh, let's say, computer vision. Um, you know, more specifically to the, this talk, you know, we, we've learned a lot from purely from, from watching motion. Uh, but I think, you know, vision obviously can, can really help uh, here as well. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, using combined motion, combined vision, combined tactile sensing to learn about your environment, to learn about things that are both occluded via motion uh, and learn about service properties. Uh, the emotion and tactile sensing. Um, and then lastly, you know, if I want to think about getting towards the dexterous manipulation, right, my in-home uh, in home robot, um, just, you know, blindly learning from random data is not going to cut it. Learning about the entire world is not going to cut it. My controller needs a relatively simple model. If I want to do real-time model-based control, it can handle a hybrid model with, say, 30 modes, but it can't handle a hybrid model with 1,000 modes. So we're going to need some kind of task-driven uh, approach here. Uh, where we can learn a task-driven model with, say, 30 modes of manipulation uh, and then apply that uh, uh, with Mendel Time Controller. So that, that's where I'm going. Very excited about, about sort of what the next uh, few years hold here. Uh, and with that, uh, I do want to you know, make sure I thank all the students who did the hard work, uh, and in particular her ALP. Uh, I didn't go did a lot of the control work. Uh, a lot of the early content learning work um, and, and some of the later work as well has been driven by Matt Holm. Uh, but in collaboration as well with Billy Bianchini uh, and uh, uh, Wenjin Jin also did a lot of work here as well, as did Sam Farmer and others. Uh, and I'll thank uh, our sponsors, NSF, Google, and, and Toyota, and be happy to take, uh, take questions. Uh, thank you again, Florian, Florian and Edward, for having me. It's been, been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for the thought provoking talk again. All right. So, uh... If anyone in the audience has any uh, any questions, feel free, feel free to ask them. You don't have to write them on the chat; just grab the mic and ask them. Ooh.
we have a oh. question. We have a question from YouTube. Uh, uh, Yuki Shirai is saying, thanks so much for your great talk. Uh, likely if you have too many complementarity constraints, I think even ADMM can take a long time to converge due to the first stage, since the first stage is MIQP. Uh, and could you tell us what your idea is to extend your multi-contact ADMM for systems with more contacts, such as multi-legged robots? Yeah, Yuki, it's a great question. Um, yeah, certainly if you have too many constraints, it's not gonna work, right? Uh, um, I think there's no, no doubt about that. Um, uh, you know, I think the I sort of hinted at this a little bit at the end. I think one approach to to really getting to let's say a system that has ten contacts or more it is uh, identifying uh, task driven models. So an example I like to use there, uh, something like grasping um, or, or in hand manipulation of a cup. Here, yes, I'm making and breaking contact. You can see the camera with you know ten or so places, um, but you know that's a horrible way to represent this problem. A, a thousand mode ver, you know, model is just not useful for, for even something like in-hand manipulation. So we need something simpler. And that's where I think uh, using some notion of the task can be helpful. Um, uh, I, I actually think multi-legged robots um, you know, is, is, even, is probably more amenable to just sort of naively using an ADMM-like approach um, because the number of contexts is, so, is fewer in a, in a robotics version. Let's say like if you had a quadruped or a, or a hexapod and you're trying to plan those six contexts, I think that actually might be a, might be tractable for something like ADMM at let's say 10 to 30 Hertz range. And then maybe you wrap that inside a higher rate, uh, you know, higher rate controller. Um, I guess in, in chat as well, another question from Yuki uh, was, uh, what is your general feeling about multi-contact control with vision and, and tactile sensors? Um, I mean, I, I'm excited. I, I think it's the easiest answer there. Um, I, I, you know, we've really started to think about what the role of tactile sensing um, should be. Um, I, I mentioned that very briefly today, just you know, in terms of bringing force measurements directly into a feedback policy. Um, that's an idea that I like a lot uh, because it's it's so simple. It doesn't require um, relatively brittle analysis of mode changes. Um, but obviously, that's it's it's also you know kind of narrow. Um, if, if I want to use something like a gel site or, or one of these, you know, vision-based tactile sensors, I have a lot of information. And, and I think, you know, one of the key questions there is what to do with that. Uh, for us, at least, model, model learning is an, is an obvious direction, right? That um, you, you get clear signals about geometry uh, and service properties from, from tactile sensing like that. Uh, but, but I think the, the future is exciting, broadly speaking, in vision, using, using vision and tactile sensing. Awesome. Uh, we have another question from YouTube. Anirudh Mahesh is asking, uh, I'm really interested in the material covered in the seminar. However, the technical equations are a bit complicated. Any advice on how I can begin to learn similar material? Um, yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the technical details are, are a bit, uh, are certainly a bit complex. Um, I personally learned a lot from um, reading some of the writing from David Stewart who's a mathematician in Iowa, who's done a lot on, on the sort of modeling um, non-smooth physics. Um, the math in, in, in his writing is a little bit dense. So you kind of have to pick and choose, you know, which aspects you try to learn from. But, uh, you know, I think he has a review paper, he has a textbook that are um, very thorough in their, in their sort of discussion of this. Um, there's plenty out there more broadly on things like complementarity uh, from from like the OR and optimization communities as well, because it's a concept that you know, it appears you know regularly in optimization, not just in, in uh, robotics. Um, so I would look there. I mean, anything. Uh, if you're really interested in physics, you could also read read papers on simulators. Right? If you read like the Majoko paper or, or 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 any kind of readable paper on on how a simulation is done, they're inevitably going to discuss how they approximate these complementarity equations, because uh, that's sort of at the core of how simulators work. Uh, any other questions from the from the live uh, audience here? I have, I have a question. Uh, I'm Kevin, by the way. Thanks for the great talk, Michael. Uh, I was curious um, what, uh, so you've shown great progress here on uh, learning the dynamics and contacts uh, from example motions, but I was curious uh, what your thoughts are on planning through multi-contact using this model. Uh, one of the concerns is basically uh, in multi-contact cases that we have a lot of different distinct modes and we can get stuck in local minima uh, and that just gets worse and worse, the more complicated the geometry is and the more possibility for in incidental contacts there are. So how, how do we deal with this? 
you know, th this is something that I spent a lot of time in my thesis on and, you know, from the planning side, I, and, and there's some nice work, you know, not just, not just from that, but from, from various follow-on papers on, on contact implicit optimization. I think the key takeaway, right, if you want to avoid those local minima is you, you want an algorithm that is not just making predictions about one particular mode and then differentiating with respect to that mode, uh, because that's where you're just inevitably going to get stuck. Uh, in, in that schedule. Uh, so anything, uh, whether it's, you know, work from Zach Manchester's group at CMU or, or Igor Mardach uh, during his thesis, that, that is working to generate gradients with respect to modes that you're not currently guessing, I think is really important. And so the ADMM work I talked about today was our attempt to do that in real time, uh, but there's also lots of arguments that, that I attempt to do that offline. Nothing, is, it, there's no panacea here. These are NP hard problems. You know, you should temper your expectations a little bit, right? Without a good guess, you're not going to get something, you know, in a, in a thousand mode problem to run at 100 hertz, right? That's just not, in my opinion, it's not going to happen. So, you know, be thinking about ways in which you can um, accept uh, suboptimality, or you can generate good heuristics, or you can generate um, warm starts, you know, things to, to try to make your life easier. If I can follow on that. Um... I, I do appreciate those sort of works, and I think they they are they, they can work in practice. But it seems like often they you kind of uh, engineering different ways of falling into a, a particular mode, and you're hoping that you'll fall into the right mode, and kind of adjusting your engineering so that you do fall in the right mode. And that seems a little bit frustrating from time to time. And I was curious yeah. if potentially learning can be an aspect here where we can integrate it somehow with, with the, the approach. So either, I guess totally. the simplest would yeah. be warm starting from learning. But yeah. I also yeah. see work like DeepGate um, that combine our all. Yeah, uh, you know, I think you're totally right, right? All these approaches, um, that you, what you're trying to do is change the lost landscape to smooth it out, right? Um, but in, you're still left with a non-convex problem. And, and so, you know, um, you're still gonna end up in a local minima and your hope is just that you end up in a good one. And, and how you do that smoothing, right, has a big effect on where you land. I think that's totally correct. Um, and then anytime you start thinking about, you know, I'm gonna apply a heuristic to smooth or, or anything else, right? Maybe you should also think about learning that heuristic. I think that's totally reasonable as well. So there's nice work on like learning warm starts from, from mixed integer problems, or, um, you know, you could, you could just warm start the local search uh, from, from a learn algorithm, or you can learn the solution. You know, there's lots of very, very various ideas, that, you know, that could apply here um, that, um, you know, again, they're not, it's not going to be a panacea, right? Because I, I just don't think the problem is amenable to a global solution uh, in a novel problem setting. Uh, but, you know, certainly maybe you, you would have an easier time tuning, uh, you know, if you were uh, leveraging uh, learned data. Great. Sorry, you can even do that in a supervised fashion as well, right? Where you use your offline optimization to, to supervise the learner. The learner. Okay, so uh, maybe it's time to uh, uh, to land the plane. Uh, and uh, thanks again, Michael, for the excellent presentation. Uh, and we'll go to the uh, to the group meetings in another uh, on another Zoom chat or another Zoom link. Uh, but thanks everyone for attending and for uh, spending time with us uh, today. And hopefully, we'll see you all uh, in person. Have a great day.